All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, thanks again for joining us for another uh, machine learning community stand up. Uh, I am Luis, your host, and with me today is my co host, Jake. Uh, so, if you've joined us before, you kind of know how this goes. Basically, we spend about an hour just talking about latest developments in the community, uh, some of the new releases, and, and just things that are happening in the machine learning uh, space within the .NET community. Um, and if you're new, uh, uh, you know, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we share a few things that might interest you here today. Um, the topic for today is going to be uh, mainly around some of the new developments and, and recent releases and announcements that we made um, within the uh, sort of machine ML.NET space. <clears throat> Um, and those pertain mainly to the sort of the text classification API, a new notebook series, um, which we're going to kind of go over a little bit later. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, AutoML and some of the uh, improvements and enhancements that we made there to the API uh, inside of the framework. Uh, I see a few folks joining here. Uh, hey, Son. Hey, hey, Jose. Mohammed, Summer, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Um, so to get started, let me kind of just go over here to um, the banner here. Uh, so today's show is brought to you by the word permutation feature important. So every show we try to uh, introduce a new term or a new topic and just kind of explain it a little bit more uh, in, in a little bit more detail. So let me kind of start here with permutation feature importance. Um, to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up one of the notebooks, which we're gonna go into a little bit later. Um, so let me just pull up the screen here. Um, okay, nope, that's not the one I wanted. There we go. Okay, so uh, permutation feature importance, let me make that a little bit bigger so it's easier to see, um, is an explainability technique. So within ML.NET, we have different ways of explaining your model. So once you've trained your model, uh, one of the things that is important to you um, is, is probably to understand why is my model making the decisions that it's making? Why is it coming up with the predictions that, that it's making? And what exactly is influencing those decisions, right? Um, just like, you know, if somebody told you, you know, hey, you know, we're going to go with, with, you know, X, Y, you know, we're going to do X, one Y thing. You know, one of the things you might ask is like, okay, well, why? Like, what's the reasoning behind that? So that's kind of where explanation comes in when it comes to machine learning models. And there's two types of explanations uh, for ML models. There's global and local explanations. So global explanations in general, um, they essentially uh, are able to explain the general behavior of a model, right? So for example, let's say that you were, um, you know, giving out loans or something like that, or in this case, you know, um, you were uh, providing rides to people, right? Um, one of the things that might influence those off the bat is, okay, well, in general, if you travel a further distance or if you take longer during the, a particular drive, right, chances are that the ride or the fair amount, how much you're going to pay for a taxi fare, it's going to be higher, right? So just intuitively, you know, you sort of think think of it that way. Um, and with these, you know, explainability techniques, you can kind of, you know, confirm that that, that is the case, right? So that's global explanations. Now, local explanations are specific to a specific instance in a data set. So uh, kind of, you know, going again to, to the taxi fare scenario, it's, it's not necessarily in general, you know, why is it um, that, uh, that, that, you know, particular taxi fare, um, you know, uh, is predicted a certain way, what influences the taxi fare. It's more specific to the ride that Luis took on Wednesday, right? Here's the reason why you know he was charged X amount, right? So there's there's a little bit more understanding of what exactly were those driving factors for that one specific sort of instance of data, right? And that's the difference. So again, as I mentioned in ML.net, we have two two techniques to address both local and local explanations. Specifically for permutation feature importance, it's a global explainability technique. So again, the general behavior of the model. We also have feature contribution calculation, uh, but in this case, we're just going to talk about permutation feature importance. And essentially the way that it works is the a, a model is trained and <clears throat> as it's trained, um, it pulls out individual sort of features one at a time, right? So for example, you know, let's say that it's the trip distance for one of the iterations, it will pull out the trip distance and it will train a model without it. And then it will see how the model has changed. And based on that change, it that's how it determines the impact that that particular feature has on the overall model, 
right? And some ways that you can kind of go about do, using permutation feature importance in, in ML.NET is as follows. So of course, you you know, you typically start with the ML context here. Um, then you can uh, basically create a, a pipeline. In this case, we've split out the data prep pipeline from the training pipeline. And you can see here, we're not doing anything special. We're just uh, applying 100 coding to these categorical columns. Um, we are replacing missing values and then we're creating a single feature vector here called features with all of the different columns or the features that we're gonna use for our model. Then we're gonna pre-process our data. Uh, after that, we're gonna determine what trainer are we gonna use. In this case, we're gonna use Fast Forest <clears throat> and the column that we're gonna use to predict is the fair amount, uh, right? In this case, we're predicting taxi fares. Uh, once we have that, we go ahead and train the model. And then last but not least, we go ahead and uh, we, we run this permutation feature importance uh, call pass it in the model that we're using, as well as the pre-processed data, and we tell it what our label column is. Now, what this is gonna do is exactly what I explained earlier, which is gonna go, it's gonna pull out one column at a time, and it's gonna try to determine the importance of those features. Um, once that's done, in this case, what we want to measure the impact is, is specifically on the r square metric, but of course, you have the option of using any other metric um, for at least for the regression scenario right, that, um, that you like. Um, and then we just e extract the different columns and column names, ultimately to come up with the feature importance, which is just, again, how, how much the value has changed, uh, compared to the input feature. In this case, you see vendor ID, which was one column it's in, it's sort of split into three columns and that's because we applied one hot encoding to it, right? So this would be, you know, vendor ID bit for there's three categories. So for each of these categories, uh, we have a particular input and the value, the larger the, the change in the value, then um, sort of that determines sort of the, the importance for this particular model. In this case, I'm not quite sure why it uh, it's, you know, highlighting these, the vendor ID and payment type. I would actually expect it to be more of the trip distance and trip time. Um, but yeah, that's in general how you would use um, permutation feature importance to explain your models and try to determine what are the features that are actually driving your model. All right, so let me kind of take up pause there and go over to our community links. So our community links, you can find them over at aka.ms slash MLNet standup dash links. Um, let's see, try to get that into the chat here. Um, at standup links and you should be able to get access both to re the recording which is going to be available of course after we stream here uh and the different community links that we're going to be talking about today so there's a few of them um, a lot of them are, are just announcements from us um if you have any feedback please fill out the feedback form i uh, will also put the link here as well in the later on uh, and there's different ways that you can all stay connected with us so let me start off uh first off with the community link we have uh the folks over at rubik's code nicola here um, has recently published a full stack course for ML.NET. So if you're interested in sort of, you know, learning ML.NET from the ground up, um, you can head on over to their site and they have essentially here um, a view of all the different things that, that the course provides you with, uh, the basis of machine learning, um, different types of tasks, machine learning tasks like regression, um, auto ML, uh, recommendation systems, image classification, all sorts of stuff, all right? So, um, yeah, so you can go ahead and check those out uh, and, and even preview what the course looks like. So if you know, you're know you interested in learning machine learning, if you're interested in learning ML.net, um, you know, this is a course that you might wanna be interested in checking out. Um, if you've sort of been following some of the, the developments around Build, you may have noticed that MAUI uh, was was released um, in at Build back in May. Um, and the folks over at Games Channel here they went ahead and created a, a sort of a video tutorial and introduction to, as to how you can use ML.NET uh, inside of a .NET MAUI application. So if you want to uh, use MAUI for whether that's, I, I believe in this case, it's for a uh, Android or a mobile application um, that it's used. But anyway, any sort of application that MAUI supports, um, this tutorial here will kind of guide you through how you can get started and how you can add machine learning to your, to your MAUI apps. And, and there's actually two parts. This is part one, and I've highlighted here also, there's there's part two here as well. So, um, you know, if you're working with Maui and you wanna use ML.net, make sure to check that out. Over at 
at the same time uh, as build, um, we published this sample here of how you can use ML.NET inside of Excel. So uh, the way that this works is you can essentially uh, create a Blazor WebAssembly application that you embed an ML.NET model inside of. And then you can expose that um, to Excel as a uh, as an Excel add-in, right? So, um, you know, you, the add-ins that you kind of see here, you can expose it as an Excel add-in. And at that point, you can then use uh, custom functions inside of uh, inside of Excel to make predictions uh, with the model that you've trained, right? So, I'll just clarify that this currently is just a, a um, it's a an inferencing sample, right? So this is not a train. It's only for inferencing, taking a model that you've already trained and embedding it into the Blazor app and and um, you know using it inside of Excel. Um, so you know with that, uh, you know you're more than welcome to take a look at the sample. Um, you know if you're interested and and go ahead and, and test it out yourself. There's all the instructions here on how you can do that. Um, I kind of introduced it a little bit earlier, but um, I'll kind of talk about it here, which is the .NET Machine Learning Notebook series. So you probably saw this notebook that I just had here. Um, you can see that there's a bunch of notebooks, um, both for C Sharp 101, uh, C Sharp scenarios, and, and the one specifically that we released a couple of weeks ago was this machine learning series of notebooks. Right? Um, so if you're not familiar with notebooks, uh, notebooks are this interactive environment where you can run uh, code cells uh, individually uh, and sort of ad hoc. So, you know, you can you can run them at in, in random order. Um, and as you see fit, you also get some graphical elements in here as well as being able to embed uh, markdown. So this, for example, here, this is a markdown. So, um, you know, it, it's really great. They're really great for documentation. Um, they're really great for learning. They're really great for teaching um, and, and explaining concepts and, and seeing code alongside, you know, some commentary. So, um, you can head on over to the um, to the C Sharp Notebooks um, repo here, and that's kind of where, where you're going to be able to find all the different uh, notebooks. Um, and if you're interested in machine learning, you can see that there's a section here with links both to, um, in, in this case, VS Notebook link. What it will do is if you click on this and if you have the Notebook Editor extension installed uh, inside of Visual Studio, you can kind of see it here, but it will launch Visual Studio directly uh, with the notebook downloaded. So you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, sort of clone the entire repository if you're only interested in a subset of these notebooks. Um, you can see that we have a, this Getting Started series, which will kind of take you through the intro to machine learning, data prep, and feature engineering. Um, we talk a little bit about AutoML as well as model evaluation, which is a notebook that I just showed you where we had permutation feature importance. We have some other end-to-end -end examples which show you uh, different machine learning tasks, um, in some cases using AutoML, um, and in some places using other APIs to, to sort of uh, help you train models and guide you through the process of training these models. And then we have reference notebooks just in general. We have this one here for the data frame. I'll kind of show you that one here. Um, if you're not familiar with the data frame, it's it's essentially this API that lets you um, sort of process data and and you know transform it, manipulate it, visualize it in different ways. Um, one second, I think because I'm I have two instances of Visual Studio open here, um, it's giving me issues. Oh, did it close? Okay, um, I can show you here. Oh, there we go. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. But anyway, um, so we have this reference notebook that shows you different. There we go. Um, there's it shows you different um, sort of things that you can do with the data frame, like inspecting your data. In this case, you're inspecting sort of how many rows, uh, the data types uh, for each of the columns inside of your data set. You're able to visualize the data set as well. Um, I think somewhere down here. Uh, where is it? Yeah, somewhere down here, it shows you how to combine and how to merge. Yes, yeah, so how to merge two data frames together, merge two columns into one. So a lot of your standard data processing operations, you can sort of find them here. And, and these reference notebooks, again, in this case, it deals with the data frame. We have others with grass and visualizations where we show plotly.net. Um, and then in this one is how can you use, um, you know, .NET and, and AutoML and all the different components inside of um, sort of the machine learning .NET ecosystem uh, to, submit <clears throat> to submit to Kaggle competitions, right? So... Make sure to check that out. Um, let me go back here to 
um, to the links. We also, if you want to like, if you want to explore in a little bit more detail what these, um, you know, what these notebooks can do and, and sort of, you know, how you can get started with the notebook editor extension. We did this uh, live stream a couple of weeks ago as well uh, on the Visual Studio Toolbox, and it basically gives you uh, a little bit more detail into what I'm, I'm sort of going through here. So uh, check that out. Um, okay, so that's the series. Um, there's this other announcement, which if you are using ARM64, um, so taking a step back, the latest preview of Visual Studio 2022 um, released a as a native ARM64 application for Windows 11. Right? And that's the first version where that allows you to both you know, uh, run applications, but also build them for ARM64 devices on ARM64 processors. <clears throat> and one of the workloads that's prioritized for, for this particular version of Visual Studio is, um, is .NET, so .NET workloads. Now, what that means is that you could use Model Builder, right, which is the ML.NET extension for training machine learning models, for, you know, for the, for the variety of scenarios. You can use that inside of uh, the ARM64 version of Visual Studio, right? And essentially the process is, is basically the same. The only difference is that you would have to install the ARM64 version of Visual Studio on your ARM64 Windows device. <clears throat> and then the, the rest of the process is basically the same. You just go through the same process that you would for enabling Model Builder um, inside of Visual Studio. Um, the only thing that I'll sort of point out or, or make a note of here is that for image classification scenarios, we actually recommend using Azure for two reasons. Number one is that on an ARM processor, it you know the, the compute required to train these types of models, uh, it's not going to be sufficient, right? Um, and number two is just you know it's not it's something that's not supported currently for ARM sixty four devices again because you know compute requirements and, and things like that. So uh, if you're looking to train image classification models, uh, definitely you know look to Azure. But everything else, for the most part, you know you should be able to use um, uh, you know you should be able to use that local machine for. Uh, and if not, you know, we want to hear from you. Let us know if, if you run into any issues. The other thing here that I want to kind of call out is what's new in terms of automated ML and tooling. So um, I believe it was last year that we introduced AutoML, uh, particularly the, the fast and lightweight AutoML, FLAML implementation um, into ML.NET, um, in, in, into ML.NET. Uh, particularly into model builder, right? So you could only use this implementation from inside of the tooling. And some of the benefits that this brought on was that um, it could explore models faster, right? So when you set the time to train inside of our, you know, the tooling, it was able to explore more models uh, just in general, right? The other thing is because it was able to explore more models, um, it wasn't really, uh, you know, timing out or it wasn't erroring out saying I couldn't find a model because uh, it was a little bit more efficient at doing that. Uh, and then last but not least, it improved some of the performance metrics. So, so not only did it find you more models, but it also typically in general, you know, in general found you better models. Um, and again, as I mentioned, these AutoML improvements, you can only take advantage of them inside of inside of the tooling, inside of um, Model Builder and the .NET CLI. Um, but as of uh, about a month ago now, maybe a little bit longer, um, you know, you're able to take advantage of some of the same functionality that's inside of the inside of um, Model Builder and the CLI. Uh, inside of the framework. Um, there's actually a sample here uh, of training an, an, an auto ML that kind of shows you how to set up an auto ML pipeline um, for training ML.NET models. And while that's loading, I see Sam here has a question. Uh, is there still a Windows IoT as you can OS you can install on the Raspberry Pi to use that model builder on ARM64? Um, I'm not actually sure, Sam. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure what the plans are for Windows IoT or what their support is. Um, but I suspect if, if, you know, if that's an ARM64 device that you have a UI and, and, and then you can install, um, you know, visual, visual studio on top of, right. I suppose it's feasible, but you know, uh, don't sort of take my word for it because like I said, I'm, I'm not very familiar with what the sort of support and, uh, you know, what the plans are for, for Windows IoT. Um, so for AutoML, uh, you can see it's, it's just for, for linear regression here, but the important thing that I want to kind of call out here is, is, um, the training process and how you set up the pipeline. Um, so let me kind of go down here. So to set up an AutoML pipeline, in this case, it's, it's basically just, you know, concatenating, creating a single feature vector. 
But the auto ML component here is just this one line here where you tell it, uh, you know, auto ML, trade me a regression model. This is the column that I'm looking to predict. Um, and you're also able to specify or choose which models, um, you know, uh, which algorithms, excuse me, uh, you can actually explore. So in this case, I don't want it to explore LBFGS, SDCA, and Fast Forest algorithms. So using that information, AutoML is going to go and try, me find, to, try to find me a model using algorithms that are not any of these. Um, then at that point, I can just create a, an experiment here, um, you know, set evaluation metrics, what I'm optimizing for, how long I want to train for, which data sets I'm using. So in this case, you can specify both training and uh, evaluation uh, or slash test sets. And a set monitor, what it's going to do is, particularly this notebook monitor, um, I'm not really going to run it here, but it provides you a really nice visual of, um, you know, the training process, uh, the number of iterations or the number of, of runs uh, relative to the uh, metric that you're optimizing for. All right. So, um, yeah. So that's essentially how you set up AutoML. One of the other really neat things with, with Auto, AutoML, if I kind of go back here to... This, right. So this kind of explains the experiment API and how you can use that, you know, sort of very similar to what I, I, I showed here. Um, the other really nice thing that um, AutoML brings you is this idea of search spaces and sweepable estimators. Now, what this means is, uh, let's say that you had a series of algorithms that you kind of knew you wanted to explore, but what you wanted help with and, and more control over was trying to find the optimal parameters. So using the suitable estimator, you can introduce, um, you know, sort of, uh, you can basically run hyperparameter optimization over specific algorithms using your defined sort of search space here, right? And, and so what this does is it gives you a little bit more control over sort of that search space um, and, uh, and, and, you know, over, over that search space uh, as well as being able to, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of get the actual what the best parameters are for that particular algorithm and, and that particular model, right? Um, so, so yeah, so you can keep it as simple as that, where you just tell it train me a regression uh, model, or you can go down and customize the individual sort of parameters and get the parameters uh, for your particular model. So that's some of the improvements that you know sort of this brings you, and you know more control. Um, again, just giving you. Um, you know the the same level of access and the same level of features they would get uh, inside of our tooling, but from a code first standpoint. Um, there is something else here. Let me I didn't include this link, but let me sort of pull it up here. Which is uh, the folks over at the Plotly.net team. They have been uh, working on providing C# -sharp binding. So if you're not familiar with Plot.net, it's it's a uh, plotting library, right? Uh, for for .net. And the library itself, it's mainly built uh, sort of as F sharp first, right? So, so it's, it's basically natively built for, for, for F sharp. Um, that means that while you could use it for, for C sharp, um, there are a few things that, you know, differ a little bit or, or make it a little bit, you know, um, in terms of IntelliSense and, and things like that, uh, you know, they work a little bit differently with C sharp, okay? So uh, the folks over at Plotly.net, they've been working to create uh, C-sharp bindings. And basically, these are all the different, um, you know, sort of areas that they're looking to cover. Mainly, you know, they want to kind of start off with some of the main or, or, or the most important sort of charts and graphs. Um, but yeah, I'll kind of take a pause there. Um, Jake, do you know any anything else on this or would like to touch on it a little bit more? Yeah. So the... The poly.net folks, we've been working with them. So uh, there were a couple of requirements that, that we needed before we could start using them um, more broadly in like our example notebooks and within our tooling. One is that we needed to get its strong name signed. And so they were we, we worked together to get the library's um, strong name signed. So now if you if you require that in your applications, you'll be able to use poly.net for, for your graphing needs. Um, but the reason why I wanted to call this, this out is that there's still a lot of work to do on the C-sharp bindings. They have checked it in. There's an initial release of the NuGet, and I'll be updating all of the example notebooks in the, the C-sharp notebooks that Luis was talking about earlier to be using the new um, the C-sharp bindings for Plotly.net. Like Luis said, it, it's basically just a wrapper that makes it so that IntelliSense works better. Um, and you know th that is just easier to use, right? It's using C-sharp types instead of some, some F-sharp types that can be hard to use from C-sharp. Um, but so my real reason for wanting to talk about this today is kind of the call to action. There's still a lot of work to do. You'll notice down below that um, he sort of marked this as a help help wanted. 
uh, it's he has some guidance. Um, if you look in, in issue 285, he has some guidance for how 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 you can go about um, helping, like what what the process is for creating these bindings. And so, if anybody in our community can can hop over here and help them out, um, we'll we'll be we'll be trying to pick up some of these items as well. And we would we would love some of your help trying to build this out so that it's really easy to use for um, for all the function functionality in Poly.net from within the .NET notebooks. Yeah, let me uh, go ahead and paste this into, uh, go a little back here, and I'll include this in the community links as well. Um, there's that, uh, and then you can follow issue 285 from there, but I'll paste it just in case. Um, cool, yeah, uh, definitely give this a look. Um, and yeah, just, you know, help, help the community uh, sort of get this going. That way it's, it's easier to use from, from C sharp. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. So that's ML.net model builder and CLI. These are things that we, uh, kind of talked about, but you know, we actually put them in a blog post, but these had taken place a, a while back, which was that fact that you can use time series forecasting in model builder, as well as, uh, you know, being able to use, uh, there's a new version of the ML.net CLI, which was released a few months ago. Um, and, and the main things that it brings is .NET 6 support, uh, support for ARM64 architectures, um, and, and of course, new scenarios as well. Um, the image classification, again, it's kind of specify that it's for x64, not for ARM64. So although there is ARM support, not there isn't for image classification. Um, one other thing that we released uh, and we talked about, I think, on our last standup was the uh, ability to add keyboard shortcuts and notebooks. So again, the notebook editor extension, it's this, you know, sort of this thing that I'm that I've been using uh, throughout the stream. Um, and you can go to extensions here, manage extensions, and you should see. There it is. So there's that notebook editor extension, right? So once you have this installed, you should be able to get started authoring and, and running um, notebooks inside of Visual Studio, right? So we've, uh, I think it was in October that we, you know, the, that it was introduced, right, Jake? The notebook editor extension? Yeah, probably, um, probably around then for its, its first release. It's yeah. way better. If you tried it back in October, try it again now. Uh, we The people from, from my team have been, uh, making amazing improvements. Like I think in that first version, there wasn't any even syntax coloring or IntelliSense or anything like that. Um, now it's a, it's a really great experience. Uh, I use it as my, my primary notebook editor now. Yep, totally. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's come really come a long way um, in terms of what it can do. Um, so yeah, so if you're interested in notebooks in Visual Studio, make sure to install the extension, add it into the link. And uh, hey, Brie, good to see you. Um, so yeah, so give this a look, um, and you should be able to, to get started with these notebooks here. Um, let's see. Okay. Last but not least, um, in terms of links and, and things that we're discussing here, um, is deep learning. So last week, uh, in sort of in line with .NET 7 preview five, which also make sure to check that out. It was released last week. Um, we introduced the ML.NET text classification API. So <clears throat> what this is at a high level, uh, so I guess, you know, first of all, what was text classification? So it's the ability to categorize or apply labels to text, right? I, I, you know, putting it simply. Um, and, you know, some, some, some common use cases for this are you can mark email or messages as spam or not spam. You can, you know, do sentiment analysis. You can apply labels to support tickets. Um, you can do all these different things with text classification. And you might be asking yourself, but I've been doing that already, right? And, and, and you might be right. Uh, so you can perform classification. You, we even have some ability to transform text inside of ML.net so that you're able to train classification models using your standard classification algorithms, right? One of the challenges though, is that some of those techniques or your standard or your standard um, classification algorithms uh, sort of have trouble with is trying to encode the context of language and the semantics and, and sort of what, what meaning a particular sentence or a particular phrase is trying to convey, right? Um, and, and that's sort of an area where your classical machine learning, your classical classification, classical classification, um, sort of algorithms 
have a little bit of trouble with. Um, more recently, there's been this with deep learning, you know, with deep learning and new techniques, um, transformers, this this particular deep learning model architecture has sort of emerged as, as sort of a predominant uh, way to solve these, these language problems. And as a result, it's given sort of birth to a lot of these these large language models that maybe you've you know you've seen in the news or you know heard about like like BERT, like GPT-2, GPT-3, right? These large language models specifically for language tasks like text specification, like text summarization, translation, and things like that, right? Um, and what so what we've done is um, we've taken let me kind of go down here. Using TorchSharp, um, we which and if you're not familiar with TorchSharp, that's essentially a set of .NET bindings for the LibTorch library. This is the library that powers the PyTorch ecosystem. It's a very popular deep learning um, ecosystem uh, sort of framework inside of Python, All right? So we've taken TorchSharp and using some of the research from Microsoft Research and in collaboration with them, we've taken an implementation of BERT. Um, so that's one of the language models that I kind of mentioned earlier. And we built an abstraction layer on top of that, right? Which is the text classification API. So that you don't have to go and build a transformer sort of uh, neural network from scratch. You can take a pre-existing model, this BERT model, and then use the text classification API with your own data to train a custom model uh, for your particular data set. Um, some of the advantages that this gives you, if you're familiar with some of with our image classification API, which is something similar, is we take a base model and then we just you know add on top of it. It works very much the same way. Uh, one of the things that this saves you is compute, right? Because you're not starting from scratch. You don't have to spend as much time training, and also you don't need as much data. Though, uh, of course, if you have more representative data, it helps. But be, again, because you're not starting from scratch, it sort of uh, it makes it a little bit easier, right? Um, so let me kind of show you what the text classification API looks like. And also you can find the end to end sample here, the text classification API with the help data set. <laughs> we'll, we'll provide you with sort of the end to end. And here's pretty much the same explanation that I just gave here um, around what the text classification, classification API is um, and how it was built. Um, but in terms of installing the packages, one of the main things that you need is to add this Microsoft ML TorchSharp um, preview package as well as the TorchSharp uh, set of packages. Now, if you're using the CPU, you're going to want the CPU version, but there's also the option of using GPU, right? So in that case, instead of torture CPU, you would use either uh, Windows or Linux. And from there, uh, basically the process is for the most part the same. You initialize your ML context, you load your data. In this case, it's, it's Yelp reviews. So you have the text here, uh, right, which are just reviews for restaurants and establishments, and the sentiment here, uh, which is just one and zero, where one is positive and zero is negative. Um, you know, you go through your process of training, uh, splitting your training test sets, and then here in your pipeline, all you need is this one sort of transform or trainer, right? So in this case, it's part of the multi-class classification trainers, and you just need to tell it which column is my text inside of, right? In this case, it's our text column. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's all you need. At that point, you just call fit and the training starts after a few seconds. Um, you know, you get a model that you can then use to make predictions with. And you can see here that uh, in our predictions, here's the text, this is a positive sentiment, and then this is a predicted label. Um, and yeah, um, one of the things that we're currently working to improve is, or call out, you know, that I like to call out that we're working to improve is that um, you, ML.NET has a series of evaluate um, sort of metrics that it automatically calculates for you based on, um, you know, based on the particular tasks. So in this case, it would be for multi-class classification. Uh, today, you cannot use those, the evaluate method that's built into ML.NET, but we are working on, on making that happen. So in this case, I, what I just did is just I created a very naive sort of calculation of what uh, the model accuracy is by taking, you know, the total of instances where the, the, the predicted value matches the actual value and then dividing that over the, all the values. And in this case, you can see with, you know, not a lot of data, we got about a 64%, uh, you know, accuracy which is, you know, okay enough, at least for, for, for um, demo purposes. 
But um, if you want to, you know, obviously to improve that, there's a few things you can do. There's there's a whole bunch of hyperparameters here that you can you can actually tune. If, I'm not sure if you can see this here, but you can set things like how many uh, epochs you want to train for, how many iterations you want to train for, uh, what the batch size or how many uh, sort of um, how many rows of data do you want to process at the same time. You can set things like um, I believe the the learning rate is something that you can also set. Um, so, so there's a few things that you can do to improve. This is just a more sort of basic example in the most basic scenario. Um, but again, there's, you're sort of in full control here in terms of what you can do. Um, so yeah. Just, uh, just to add that, yep. this is still pretty early on. So these are in our preview versions of NuGets. If, um, if Luis scrolls up to the top, you can see it's kind of our, our preview versions. And so what that means is we want feedback. We want you to go try it out. Give us feedback. Let us know what you think of the APIs. Um, and, and yeah, we'll keep making improvements. We're also going to kind of combine things. So Luis earlier was talking about... Sorry, I had an alarm going off my house. Um, Luis earlier was talking about AutoML. So eventually we'll bring AutoML to these uh, to this scenario as well so that you don't, have to, you don't have to know what those hyperparameters are that Luis was talking about. We'll make it easier to use. And um, then, then you'll just be able to you know, worry about your data set and the problem and the solution instead of instead of trying to tune your hyperparameters. Yep, totally. Um, I think I saw a question further up. Uh, okay, Jose, I, I see. Uh, is this link install ARM64 Visual Studio for Model Builder or Visual Studio for ARM? I believe it's for Visual Studio for ARM. Um, if I remember correctly, Mm, let me kind of go back to the links here. Uh, what's new? Train machine learning models. Yeah, this is just the instructions that the blog post here sort of calls out for how you can get started with the ARM64 version of Visual Studio. So once you have that installed, um, the process for enabling... So so Model Builder comes out, out of the box inside of Visual Studio, right? So once you have Visual Studio installed, it's just a matter of enabling it in in the as one of the workloads, right? Uh, and there's instructions for that here as well um, in the sort of in the in the post here, and you can see um, how you can how you can enable it. And this is installed, but basically you're just enabling it, uh, just like you would any sort of uh, other other workload. Cool. Um, Let's see here. So let me kind of go back to the, or is it the C sharp notebooks? Uh, did I lose it? Yeah, one second here. Yeah. So <clears throat> in terms of the C sharp notebooks, uh, one of the things that we want, just like we, you know, with the, um, just like with the text classification API, just like with um, the AutoML API, all these things are sort of in, in preview and, and they're new things that we're, we're introducing and trying out to make the experience better. Um, but at the end of the day, we we do need your feedback and you're the ones that are going to kind of, you know, help us decide what are the areas that we, we want to kind of focus on, on next. Um, in terms of other tech scenarios, because sort of we've, um, we've enabled the text classification scenario for this particular use case, but because we have a general idea of how we can go about integrating TorSharp into ML.NET and how we can bring these transformer models or these large language models into ML.NET, um, at the end of the day, uh, it's going to be also up to you to kind of help us decide, okay, well, what are the different scenarios that you think are missing that that you'd like to see us bring to to the ML.NET framework um, and and things like that. So again, you know, post post on the post feedback post feedback in the um, in the repos. And let us know what, what are the things that are important to you and how we can make this experience just better overall. And the same goes for notebooks, right? So the notebooks are also something that we're you know previewing. Let us know what are the things that uh, you know that you that are important to you, things that you like, and how how we can improve those. Um, okay. Let's see if there. Oops. Um, yeah. So let us know if there's any questions so far and of anything that we've sort of, um, you know, shown off here. Um, you know, thoughts, feedback. 
and we'd be happy to you know to answer any. Adam and I were also happy to call it a day. Cool. I think we can call it. All right, let's do it. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, folks. Um, again, let us know in the comments, uh, uh, in, in the issues, in the repos, if there's anything that you'd like, um, you know, for us to to work on, uh, or that you'd like to see with any of these things that we've announced. Also, the feed, the link here, aka.ms, and all that stand up feedback, is for feed, any feedback that you have regarding stand up things or topics that you'd like for us to cover. Uh, maybe even guests, if there's anything cool that you're working on that you'd like to show off, let us know, and we'd be happy to, um, yeah, to to kind of you know bring that person on, even you know yourself. Um, other than that, uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Take care, bye, folks. <laughs>